scientist and physical therapist at the University of British Columbia. She is a professor and has held a Canada Research Chair, a Michael Smith Foundation for Health Career Scientist Award, and been a Peter Wall Early Career Scholar. Dr. Boyd directs the Brain Behavior Lab at the University of British Columbia. Her TED Talk, After This, Your Brain Will Not Be the Same, has over 25 million views. Dr. Boyd is an expert in mapping how behaviors, environments, and experiences affect brain health and learning using techniques such as magnetic resonance imaging and non-invasive brain stimulation. To date, this work has largely examined the impact of exercise and learning on neurobiology. In 2020, she was a Wall Scholar focusing her work on the importance of the arts for brain health. I guess, can you tell us a little bit about um, the research in uh, brain health and development? I know that's a huge topic, but I guess just kind of like in quote unquote a nutshell. Yeah, I mean, I can kind of frame it historically, like how okay, we got, fine. yeah, you know, where we are. I think that's the easiest way to do it, at least for me. So um, it, it's really interesting. Um, until about the mid 90s, the conception of the brain was that it was very fixed and static that, you know, once you damaged it, there wasn't a whole lot you could do. And really after uh, probably puberty, there wasn't a lot of developmental change in the brain. It's very kind of hardwired. That was that. Um, and then, and then really coming with the advent of technology where we could look inside the brain and take pictures with MRI in particular, but also with things called PET scans, which show the met metabolic properties of the brain. People started to become aware of this, um, of the uh, kind of neurobiology underpinning just the extensive change that the brain can undergo. And so that kind of just opened up this field of the question, asking the question, well, what changes it? Like if it can change, can we change it for the better? Can we change it for the worst? And so then that's, I've got, I was just lucky enough to come along and being interested in the brain at like the exact same time as all of that was happening. So some of my career is a little bit of a happy accident in that we have this, we have this knowledge that we know the brain changes and we have the tools to both look at it and then also to sometimes stimulate it or interact with it. And so that's really the, been the arc of, of my career is, so what are the things that can positively shape the brain to make you a better learner, either through development or to help you relearn after you've damaged the brain? So how do we make it better, faster? How do we you know, get to the recovery that we wanna to get to? And then we have all these neat tools that we can map it as we go. So there's turns out there's lots of ways that everything we do is changing the brain. That's the kind of the, the bottom line of it all. And then the question becomes, how do you make choices about doing things that are going to make your brain the healthiest and kind of the optimizing its performance the best that you possibly can? And then that's that's my work in a nutshell, or part of it, because it's a huge question, right? No, 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 of course, it's a huge question. I mean, we could yeah. spend hours upon hours doing this. In this careers. <laughs> what your yeah. career is all about. So. Yeah. Yeah, uh, definitely. So for those that don't know, what does it mean by um, the phrase that the brain is plastic or, you know, what is quote unquote neuroplasticity? Yeah. So in a, in a nutshell, your brain is changing all the time and it can change in, in three ways. And all those ways are, they're all changing at the same time. Like I'll describe them separately, but they're happening together. So when we first are learning something new, the fastest and kind of the the most short-term way our brain can change is by changing its chemistry. So you have to know a little bit about how the neurons, the brain cells work. So you have your neurons, you have tons of them. We have a hundred billion in the brain. So it's not a trivial number. And they're, they're sitting very closely packed to one another, but they don't actually touch. Like I like to think of them as like touching. They don't. They're very, very close to one another. And there's a very small space between them. So the way that they communicate one neuron to the next is by releasing chemical packages. It's called neurotransmitter. And so you can alter the excitability of the brain. You can kind of turn it up or turn it down by increasing or decreasing the neurotransmitter, the chemistry that's available. So we can very rapidly change the amount of this neurotransmitter that's in certain parts of the brain. And so that, that's the first and the kind of the short-term way that it can change. If you learn something and you have it in your short-term memory, like you meet someone at a party and they introduce their name and, and you have it, you have that name for a fleeting amount of time, that would be a, a chemical change probably supporting that. 
So that's the first way that you're plastic. The second way is actually by changing the structure of your brain. Mm -hmm. So our structure is a little more fixed. Um, it tends to be a, a we, it's more hardwired. Think about it like freeways on the road. You know, they're going certain places. But if, if you have a single lane highway versus a five lane freeway, the speed can change. So that's one thing that can happen. So we can get thickening and thinning of brain areas that allow things to transmit faster or slower. And then things that we practice a lot, we tend to have um, you know, more brain devoted to it. It's almost like you know, working at the gym, getting bigger biceps. So if you're a violinist and you're, you're practicing a lot with your fingering hand, that the finger representation in your motor cortex also gets bigger. So you've kind of buffed it up through the practice. So you have your chemical change, you have your structural change. And then lastly, you'll have a functional change. You could turn different parts of your brain up and down with different intensities. So as you learn something and get really good at it, you actually need less brain. So your brain can turn down and be more efficient to do other things. So you change your chemistry, you change your brain structure, and then you change your brain function. And then all those three kind of working together, that's, that's neuroplasticity. Um, and they're pretty neat and they kind of operate at different time scales. So a cool thing about that short-term change is that for it then to become a long-term change, for you to remember that person's name that you met at the cocktail party, um, you know, when you see them in the grocery store later, you actually have to have induced a structural change in your brain to have that long-term memory be created. That's something we've been really interested in is how do you take a short-term memory and make it into a really permanent, easy to access long-term memory? And there's some strategies you can do around them. Um, the one that's absolutely essential is sleep. So that's why we, that's one of the big reasons we sleep is to take these short-term memories and make them into long-term. Right. Which I think is really cool. Yeah. I, um, it's really cool. Yeah. The best thing that I ever heard about sleep in the brain, and this was when I was starting to get my master's and then I stopped, but um, was that um, sleep helps the brain um, basically empty, quote unquote, the garbage cans. So, yeah, definitely. Um, it's full all day and then it gets emptied at night. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, it's a really key element of that. And in addition to doing that, it seems to take fragile memories and make them strong. So strengthening them. Um, so the other interesting thing that will do that, that a lot of my work has been centered on is exercise. So if you pair aerobic exercise with new learning, it's also another means by which you can really strengthen um, those memories and that memory formation. Yeah, no, that's like really, really cool. And yeah. so I think a lot of people may already know this answer, but is there a way for um, your one's entire life um, for the brain to change? I don't mean from a negative standpoint in the sense that, you know, people obviously have injuries and um, so forth, but, you know, also post injuries. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. So our, our brains are always changing, whether or not we want them to. Okay. Um, so if you're not doing much, they're going to change. And that's this negative way that you were alluding to. But certainly then all the behaviors and experiences you're engaging with, um, even after an injury, are shaping your brain, are causing it to change and hopefully changing it in positive ways for allowing you to you know, perform tasks that maybe were hard or learn new things. And that's that's recovery. And that's why recovery it never really ends at some level. Right. So you have different time scales of recovery, you recover faster or slower, but it's always this kind of continuing slow arc of change. Yeah, no, and that's, um, it's really cool and it's um, really, really neat. Um, so what is electrophysiological, what are the f electrophysiological um, methods or approach or approaches that are appropriate for assessing neuroplasticity in humans? Sorry. Right, so this is a big technical thing. So electrophysiology, what is that? So we now have tools that we can use to both record from the brain and then also map brain changes and then also speed brain changes. So you kind of three categories there. So the first one's old, an old idea. So you, everyone's probably heard of an EEG or an electroencephalogram. So you put on the cap and you have these little, these little recording devices and you're recording the electrical potentials off the top layer of the brain. And you get these big squiggly lines and you can kind of infer things about cortical excitability around that. That's been around for a long time. Those techniques are now really, really highly refined. So we uh, we just have a new system and in, we're installing in my lab actually on Thursday 
where you have this it's a neural net. So the whole brain is almost covered with electrodes, 256 of them, very dense. And so you can get these beautiful arrays of activity. So that's one piece of this electrophysiology. The part that we've done more of in my group, and we're really excited about using are ways where we can map excitability changes in the brain. And the way that we can do that is we have a device called transcranial magnetic stimulation. So it, what it is, is it's, um, it's an electrical coil and it actually induces a current into the brain. Um, it's painless and it, it's a current that is electromagnetic. So it passes through your scalp and your skull and it just kind of feels like a tap. You don't actually feel it, you don't feel a shock. And so we can actually use this approach to see, to assess how excitable brain regions are because we can see we need more or less a current to pass in to get a response. Um, and so this is a way that we can actually map the physiology of the brain and we can see, we can map changes um, after uh, brain damage. One of the key questions we have after stroke is, is the wiring between the motor areas of the brain and the hand still intact? And sometimes a person can't move their hand, but we can put electrical current into the hand motor area and evoke a twitch. And then we know that, if, for example, if you will, the wiring is still intact. So that's, that's a really positive sign mm -hmm. for stroke recovery. But then last, you can drive uh, trains of this stimulation into the brain using this transcranial magnetic stimulation. And you can actually, for a short period of time, excite or in inhibit brain regions. So this is uh, the, the basis of new therapies for depression, which are now FDA approved, very widely accepted, very, very effective, um, low cost, there's no pharmacology, very few side effects. It's now being used also for obsessive compulsive disorder. And then there's a, there are many of us working to expand that, in, that out as a therapy for stroke or brain injury. So that's kind of the, together, you have all these different tools that you can kind of package together. There's one more approach and that's called transcranial direct stimulation. And this is where you actually wear two stimulators on your brain, you actually pass a current through the brain. So you excite one area and you inhibit the other where the current comes and goes. And that's another approach to um, kind of exciting the brain to try to speed recovery. But there's a catch with all of these approaches though. And that is you can't, they're not the treatment. So they're an adjunct to the treatment. So if I pass a current through your brain, you won't get any better. You won't learn anymore. What I will do though, is I'll pre-excite your brain. And then if you pair that with something else, trying to learn a new motor skill, for example, or in the instance of depression, cognitive behavioral therapy, then you get this really big response. So we talk about them as priming or preparing the brain to learn. You still have to do the learning bit though. You don't get to take you don't get to get out of doing the homework, if you will. Right. No, of course. And now it's so funny because I get EEGs. I um, I have, well, I still get them even though I've been seizure free, but um, so, yeah. I've had yeah. so I go all yeah. the time. So you've been down that path, right? EEGs. No, no, no. I know, I know a big time. Um, And I love seeing the squiggly lines. I don't have no idea what the EEGs mean. They don't look like anything when you first collect them. I know. Yeah, exactly. But um. Anyways, but I know that I know them very well. But so with all of these different techniques and the research that you're doing, do you um, do do you do or do you do the work with people that uh, have obviously mostly normal brains, but people that don't have an injury to the brain, and then also those that do have an injury to the brain to kind of see, or is it more is your work more geared towards just seeing how the typical brain, quote unquote. Right. So we do all of the above. So most of my studies actually involve three groups. Oh, so we we'll look at um, young, healthy individuals. Like if your brain is, you know, right, you know, you're a 25 year old healthy person, what's happening there? We look at older adults because we see a lot of changes just with aging. And so what's the difference between young and older adults in terms of brain function and excitability? And we need those older adults because most of my work, not all of it, but much of it involves individuals with stroke and they're older adults. So we need to know, is that change because they're older or because they had a stroke? So we actually need all three. And we very often run a study kind of from the, from the ground up. So we'll start with our young people and then we'll go into the older adults. And then lastly, to individuals with stroke and kind of working out that way. So we, we do some other work as well. It's, uh, most of my work is on stroke, but we work with other labs. So right now we have studies looking at Parkinson's disease and um, also with spinal cord injury. 
Uh, and some of my colleagues are working on acquired brain injury as well. Um, wow. So it, it's a it's a it's a mixed bag um, right. of different different folks. And what's really interesting to me is sometimes when we see commonalities across those diagnoses, because it just tells us something important about the brain and not specific, for example, just to stroke or multiple sclerosis. It's kind of some kind of uniting feature. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, the brain's, you know, ever um, changing and it's, you know, there's, it's going to be new stuff all the time, which obviously that's your work. Uh, so what have you learned, I guess, and it doesn't need to just be, I don't know, within X period of time, but just in general um, about cognitive functioning and how um, that affects um, neuroplasticity. Yeah, it's really interesting. So we used to think you know, 15 years ago, probably that you had kind of motor function in one box and cognitive function in the other, and they, they didn't really interact. And it turns out that's not true at all. And so what we find is that cognitive functioning um, is also highly neuroplastic. In fact, it may, in some ways, the neuroplasticity you see in cognition sometimes is faster. So our motor system's kind of stupid. Um, so think about like learning to play the piano. It just takes like massive amounts of practice, 10,000 hours minimum, right? Before you can get even just the, the fingering movements down. You can hear it in your head. You just can't get it to come out. Whereas your cognitive system, you, know, you can learn a fact, an equation, an address, one or two exposures and remember it for the rest of your life. It's pretty remarkable. And so that they are somewhat different in how we learn those different things. The cognitive system, very interestingly though, seems to be very, very important for that motor system recovery. Um, and so we find that things like your ability to pay attention becomes really important for both learning new facts and learning new movements. Like that seems to be this kind of key part we actually have two studies underway right now where we're trying to look at that very closely. So one is doing our exercise intervention after stroke um, and looking at motor recovery, but also seeing if, do we just have the side effect of improving cognition? So we're not training cognition, but we are testing it to see if just improving fitness, improving this motor skill practice will have this uh, side effect. And something similar in the study of recovery from acute stroke, where we're mapping cognition very early after stroke, and then mapping it kind of serially with our outcomes of motor recovery and trying to see how those two are going together. It's a little different in our stroke patients. I have to, I wanna make it clear, as opposed to someone who's young with um, a brain injury, because as we age, our cognitive function does appear to decline in some ways. And, um, in part, that's because we sometimes will accumulate very small lesions in our brain. Um, they're very small, they're called lacoons, like less than a millimeter, teeny, teeny ones. But as these start to accumulate, eventually they affect our cognition. And this is now what we understand can be a major source of dementia and poor cognitive function in very old adults. Um, and these arise as just a result of uh, ongoing high blood pressure. It just becomes hard to get blood deep in the brain with age. And so you start to accumulate these. So in our question around stroke, if we have older folks with stroke, they're kind of dealing with several things at once. More often than not, they have a stroke and they have lots of these small little strokes, these lacoons. So they're kind of fighting a fight on two fronts, if you will. Whereas a young person with a head injury or a brain injury is now working with this young, beautiful brain. And they usually have a much better recovery profile because they, they're starting off with a stronger kind of um, brain to work with. Right. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. Quite different. Yeah. Um, and I guess, how does, I mean, obviously, cognitive functioning, as we're talking about, affects neuroplasticity, but um, is there some type of difference between um, multiple cognitive functioning um, affecting neuroplasticity versus, you know, quote unquote, just one deficit? I mean, I don't know. I guess you could maybe look at people with learning challenges because it, you know, it could right. be you know, ADHD or ADD, I'm just saying like attention, yeah. um, like how does that whole process work? Right. It is, it's a really good question. And I'm not sure we really know the answer. That's, that's the bottom line. Oh, wow. So a lot of people haven't carefully, we haven't really carefully taken what we know about neuroplasticity and brain science and really looked at, for example, people who learn differently. 
So someone with ADHD or a learning disability for some reason, um, dyslexia, for example. And that work is very new, it's very nascent. So people are just starting to look at those folks. And we've done some of those studies. We have a few, we have a few under underway right now. And you know, we don't really see any difference in the trajectory of brain change. We see that those um, kids, we're looking at kids, that they learn, that they show equivalent amounts of change as compared to um, healthy controls. What we do notice, they just start in a different place. So because they're starting at a lower function, even though they change a lot, they're still behind when they when they get to that next step or when do they get to the end of the study. So it suggests that their brains are neuroplastic, but they may be a they may be accomplishing it in a, in a different way. They may be using different brain regions. Um, they may need more practice. They may need different kinds of practice, but it seems like the core ability for neuroplasticity is preserved. So you can still change it. Right. It might be a heck of a lot harder, but mm -hmm. it's, but it is there. Right. So I thought that was really um, exciting when we started to see those, those trajectories of change. And basically if you, if you change the scale, they look just the same as a healthy, as a healthy kid. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's, that's yeah. not a bad. Yeah. So this is technically, and I know the answer very well, and it's technically a neurologist question, but um, what, for those that don't know, I guess the underlying uh, causes and what happens with the brain, um, what is a stroke? And, you know, what are the changes that we can see in a stroke? And then like, what type of strokes um, do you quote unquote specialize in or do more research on, or is it just strokes across the board? Yeah. So we tend to look at stroke across the board. I don't do as much with pediatric stroke. So oh. I'll back up and say what stroke is. So stroke is just a, a disruption in blood flow to the brain period. And it, and it doesn't really matter how that happens. There's basically three different ways it can happen. The most common way is what we call an ischemic stroke. And that's what we see mostly in older adults. So there's, there's a blockage in a blood vessel. So stroke is basically plumbing at some level. And if you block the pipe and the blood can't get through, brain cells die. Um, we see strokes in older people as we age and we build um, two things. We have high blood pressure. And so our vessels become more um, uh, uh, firm or tense, um, hardening, if you will. And then we also will start to build up fatty plaques on the inside of those blood vessels. And so the kind of most common source of stroke is one of those fatty blocks breaks plaques excuse me fatty plaque breaks off it floats along through the blood vessel until the pipe is too small causes a blockage and right. we have uh, the death of brain cells you could also have a bleed so you could have a vessel that has a weakness in it and that that vessel will break and then you have a bleed in the brain and that also will kill neurons and then lastly you can have an air or a water bubble and that's called an embolus. Those are quite rare. Uh, you might see that after a, a bad injection, for example. Mm -hmm. And that would be more common in someone maybe who is self-injecting and not, not as careful as they ought to be. They're much more rare. Um, most pediatric strokes are the bleeding kind because our vessels are very sensitive and very um, uh, fragile when we're first born. And also um, that's when you will typically see a vessel that's malformed actually have a breakage. Um, in fact, your highest risk for stroke is in your first week of life, which is terrifying. And when I was uh, pregnant and having children, I'm really glad I didn't know that statistic. <laughs> so I'm not sure. <laughs> Sorry, everybody, if I made you nervous. Um, and then as we age, um, you see your stroke risk increasing kind of linearly um, across age. So in my group, we don't really look at kids with stroke. Um, they're very different, again, because they have these beautiful young brains and they tend to recover in a very different way. Um, I tend to look at adults um, with, with stroke. The last thing about stroke though, is the best predictor of who's gonna have a stroke is already having had one, especially if you're one of these older adults. And so very often in our patients, we see more than one stroke as well. You'll see multiple strokes sometimes. Sometimes people don't realize they've had multiple strokes. We do MRI imaging and we'll ask you, did you know you have two strokes or three strokes? And they, they may or may not be aware of that. So, wow, that's yeah. Uh, so how does brain reorganization help um, someone who has brain damage? Yeah, so what you'll see, and maybe I'll say with stroke because it's simple, but you could expand this out to different kinds of damage. So what you see is that the area around the stroke itself becomes really dynamic. It's called the penumbra. This area just outside of stroke, it tries hard to kind of take over lost function of the cells that were damaged by the stroke. 
So that's one way, and it, it operates through those plastic processes I outlined before. So you see changes in chemistry and structure and then function. Then the whole brain actually becomes very involved with time in terms of helping to recover from stroke. And you'll see uh, distant areas taking over lost function. You'll see whole networks of activity emerge that are totally different than uh, the networks that were there previously. And an interesting thing, because you asked about it before, is we often see that with learning, people using much more cognition to, as a compensation to kind of as, an, as a really thoughtful work around the problems that they're having. Um, and so you see these systems kind of working together to try to stimulate change. So you see the brain reorganizing kind of in, in a wholesale fashion. And that takes a lot of time and a lot of practice and a lot of effort. And so you'll, you'll see that continuing for it, the fastest period of recovery is in the first 30 days mm -hmm. when things plateau to, a, you know, plateau a bit, um, but still continuing pretty rapidly to three months. And then at six months, you see things start to kind of level off, but you never see a stop or a cessation of change. It just continues just at a slower pace, even well, well after the stroke, even years after stroke. Yeah, no, of course. I mean, and also I feel like, well, I feel like it is true, but the younger you are, the more plastic or, you know, the more recovery right. I feel like with the brain growing. Yes. Or yeah, that's absolutely. And there's magnificent data showing that. I mean, you'll, you'll see some children who've had a whole half of their brain removed. They have what's called a hemispherectomy and they're still extremely functional. If you, if you did a hemispherectomy oh, I on me, yeah. I would die, <laughs> right? I would be I, I literally, I mean, we, an adult could not survive that. Whereas a child will and will, will have this amazing, remarkable ability afterwards. So it's it's truly a, a pretty, amazingly interesting. it's an amazing thing. Yeah. Really, really an amazing thing. So how, I guess, so when an action is performed, so let's just say, well, let's just, um, I'm just gonna do more um, motor movements, but. Sure. So when you pick up, so I'm just using this with my iPad, for instance, um, what like signals the brain to and the brain basically go down your spinal cord? You know, obviously I'm not going to get into all the systems and so forth because no one's going to understand them, but um, that tells X, Y, and Z muscles, and this could be very complicated, but I guess just the, um, the, the overall, the overview um, to pick this up. Yeah, so well, first your your frontal cortex has to decide you wanna pick it up. You have to have an intention. Right. And it, it will then, uh, it has an intention. It sends that, that idea to an area called the premotor cortex, which develops a plan for picking it up. It sends a command to the motor areas. Um, and then that's what initiates the movement down your spinal cord out to the muscles. The spinal cord actually picks the muscles. The brain doesn't care. Brain says, pick it up. The spinal cord does the dirty details of I'm going to do this muscle. My hand's going to open based on experience. Your hand will actually, as you're moving towards something, start to get ready and it will open the right amount. So if you're picking up something really big, you'll see your hand like this versus a pencil. It comes like this. So all that's coded lower. Um, and then, you know, you grasp the object. And as soon as you grasp the object, you're getting feedback back to the brain. So we have these mechanoreceptors in our fingertips that will tell us if it's slipping. And that's super, super rapid. So your brain's getting this feedback of grip harder. Oh gosh, it's actually really fragile. Grip less, you're breaking it. Like all, all that happens in, in very quick time. Um, and then you get you know, the information back to the brain. Was it successful or not? You know, how much effort did it need to pick up? So something that's really cool in the learning process is that plan that's sent for movement a copy of it gets sent to the cerebellum, this old part in the back of our brain. And the cerebellum then looks at all this action and says, okay, that was the success. Good job, go again. Or the cerebellum might say, no, that plan didn't work, that it slipped or it didn't sound right. You know, playing piano like, oh, it doesn't sound right. So something about the feedback of what happened there goes to also to cerebellum. Cerebellum will send out a series of adjustments back up to brain, up to prefrontal cortex, up to premotor cortex. And then if you're gonna do it again, you'll have a modified plan the next time around. We think this is a really important loop for learning is this kind of evaluation. Like, was that successful or was it rotten? You get, think about it with baseball, it's the easiest analogy. Did I hit the ball? It's a pretty, right. pretty important outcome. And where did it go? Did it go where I wanted? So your cerebellum is making all of these real-time adjustments. And then the next time you do it, it's different because your brain's evaluated the success. 
right. of the last one. This is an elegant, beautiful system. Yeah, no, I think it is. I don't think people realize how much the brain works. I mean, yes, I, all, all, really, all the like, time, right? I don't think of it, but it really yeah. operates, you know, every Yeah. Um, and it's never at rest, right? Your brain is never turned off. It's always working, even if well, you no, don't it think is. it's doing I mean, anything. Talk about sleeping and dreams and REM and all, you know, REM yeah. sleep, whatever, all the um, different yeah. things are. I mean, yeah, that's, yeah, the brain right. never shuts off. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's really, really cool. So, due to neuroplasticity, does a certain skill like increase um, or I get, yeah. I guess, increase exponentially? So it, it probably isn't exponential because that is just too fast. You know, I, at least not to my knowledge. We've never mapped anything yeah. changing that quickly. I have a um, research project for you. There you go. But, but what you will see is these, these rapid periods of change that occur in our behavior that are supported by neuroplasticity. And there's this really cool idea that we've played with a lot in my lab. It's called the challenge point hypothesis. And that is, you see optimal change when the difficulty of the task is just, is just right. And that place, that difficulty level is different for everyone. The mine is different than yours. It's different than my daughter's who's lurking off camera, by the way. Mm -hmm. You know, right? But we all have one that is different. And so we now try to map these with what are called learning curves. Because what we find is if a task is too easy, you're not really changing. You don't need to because you can do it. And if it's too hard, you're not really changing um, because it's just too difficult. You can't accomplish the task. So what you're always trying to do is just find that sweet spot where you're getting the most amount of change in your behavior. We see that that's also the point where you get the most amount of change out of your brain. Um, and so we've written computer programs that are they're looking at this rate of change. We give it a window. We say, make it, make it like this hard all the time. And so then as you get better, it adjusts the task and makes it hard again. So we're thinking about pushing people back up that curve to keep things optimally difficult. Right. And I think that's kind of the sweet spot. So if you're really... If you're really being challenged appropriately by you know your schooling your therapist your coach they're keeping you in that hard zone mm -hmm. um it's not unmanageable but it's not easy and so the other thing that we find is that actually failure is really good for learning so if something's really hard and you're making mistakes like i i go to, you go to pick up your ipad and you drop it you, you failed right you didn't squeeze hard enough and that's a real bummer and you remember that and so you often won't do that twice that's a single mistake right and so you, it's a huge amount of learning from that from that error so mistakes are not bad and learning being very hard is actually fantastically good mm -hmm. yeah i think i mean i think error is good overall i mean who doesn't who doesn't learn from error i mean i always say this about people and just in general it doesn't have to do with the brain but like if we were all the same we didn't have right issues or there weren't you know obviously deficits of the brain or whatnot i mean we live in a pretty boring world and would have jobs absolutely you know, like, <laughs> you know everything would be the same uh so what excites you the most about your research oh it's you know what it, the best part is i i honestly learn something new every day so wow. i'm just lifelong learner right i love school i never left really that's what professors are people who've never left school uh, we just stop taking tests instead we give them. <laughs> yeah, but um, I, I it's really a, a privilege to get to learn something new every single day. And then the other really lovely part is working with the people around me. It's been the hardest part about this pandemic is because we're always on these stupid screens. But yeah. I mean, I have this amazing group of talented grad students and fellows who are they ask the best questions. They're smarter than I'm ever going to be. And then we get to also interact with, you know, wonderful people who have real problems and real questions and are giving their time and energy to help us learn. And so just that mix is just, it's just wonderful to, when you put it all together. It's, it's, a, it's a privilege, honestly. I'm very, very lucky. Your work is very unique and it's something that I don't think there's, I mean, there's not a lot of people out there like you. Um, of course, there's scientists and this and that, but someone that specializes so um or just concentrates um in such a unique way with the brain i think is really i think it's really unique oh um, thank you very much thank you so what's um one piece of i should like say what is one uh resource for people uh who want to delve deeper into brain health like to learning you but <laughs> yeah 
Well, it, you know, there's there's a few different ways to do it. If you want to be really current, there are a lot of, of, of papers published that are open access, so everyone can grab them and read them. And I I always say, you know, that's really the the best way because information is is out there for everybody. Then I would I would remind everyone too that if you have questions, you know, um, reach out to the scientists, email us. Um, you know, I, I answer as many emails a day as I can with different bits of information or websites or would you like to be in my study? I email that back to people. A lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so that's always a great resource. I think the TED Talks are great because they're so good at distilling and dialing things into these digestible topics. I mean, that that's just wonderful. And you can sit and interact with them. And then if you like to read, there's a ton of great books. Um, Jill bolte you know, a stroke of, of a genius where she's having her stroke and she's describing it. That's a remarkable, remarkable resource. Um, and if you're interested in the history of how this came about, you know, anything by Oliver Sacks is wonderful because he was just at that leading edge of thinking about why do we even have a brain? What does it mean? And those right. types of things. So there's, there's lots and lots out there. Um, yeah. So there's yeah. many ways to go with it. Sounds good. And then obviously, obviously this website and your interviews are fantastic. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Um, and I just probably only have one more question. I think this is such valuable information and um, for our audience. But um, what, I guess, what do you have planned or, you know, what type of um, research do you foresee you and your students doing um, yeah. in the future, whenever that is? I know we're working on it. So the thing that I'm most interested in right now, um, it's actually two things, but they're related. So remember I was describing to you this idea that when we're learning, we all have this individual place, our, what's called our individual optimal challenge. Right. And, and the one lesson I've really learned is that our brains are so unique. You know, we all have a brain, but they look so different one to the other. And we, we do these studies and even in healthy people, we see really varied patterns of activity and change in the brain, even when we try to control all these different factors. And so it, it really speaks to the need to individualize um, the way we think about learning and the way we think about recovery after the brain is hurt. So we're trying very hard to start to um, develop algorithms or decision trees that help us get the right therapy to the right person at the right time, right? Because all of those things matter and they, they're very intricate. And so I think in, in, in recovery and rehabilitation and neuroscience to a certain degree, um, you know, we've applied a single treatment to a huge group of people, and then we wonder why it didn't help everyone. And it's because for a lot of those people, it was the wrong treatment at the wrong time. So that's what we're working on. The way we're trying to do this is to develop what are called biomarkers. So things we can measure objectively that are going to tell us, okay, for Alexandra, at this point in time, this is the right therapy, and it should be at this difficulty. So it's totally personalize it, where you would say for Laura, nope, she's not there yet. Maybe she's not ready for rehab after her stroke yet. She needs a little bit more time. And then we're going to come with this other therapy at this other time. So we need to start to really make it personal. Um, you could look, for example, at, at cancer and, for example, breast cancer. If both you and I had breast cancer right now, the chances that we got the same, same therapy would be very remote. So there's a lot of genetics done around cancer therapies and then different drugs are prescribed at different times to different women based on those profiles. Um, they're not perfect yet, but that's kind of the pathway that I think we need to head down in neuroscience and neurology. This is highly personalized approach. Um, the issue, we, the reason why we haven't is because to do that kind of work requires a huge amount of data because you need to know all the individual profiles. And so that's the kind of stuff we're working on now, our big databases, and then the, uses, the use of machine learning of computers to help us kind of start to tease out all these different profiles of change. So I think that'll keep us entertained for a while. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's going to entertain you for 20 a years of work. <laughs> um, yeah, how do you do your research now with COVID? I mean, are you guys back on campus some of the time? I don't know what's going on. Yeah, it's a bit of a mess right now. So, you know, we were, we were last spring, we were doing nothing. Over the summer, we gradually opened back up here in Canada and things were looking good. We had our second surge like everyone else. And then we were reopening and we right now are back on a shutdown. We're doing some research, but we unfortunately here are suffering from the uh, COVID variants. Uh, I think we have more of the Brazilian variant here in British Columbia. I know they're scary as I'll get out. So we've really backed off. Um, okay. We The last thing we want to do is get anyone sick, uh, you know, not us or our patients or... 
So we're doing a lot of work remotely. Um, but one thing we have been able to do is there are these big data repositories in the world. And so we've really been working on existing data to try to do exactly some of the work I've been describing to you. So it, it hasn't been a lost year. We're not collecting more data, but we're working on things that we have. Yeah. Um, so there's something called the UK Biobank. The United Kingdom has collected data on 100,000 people. Wow. And 25,000 of them have brain scans. And so we have, we're accessing data from that source. There's some other sources in the US. Uh, there's a, a consortium called Enigma that has big brain databases. So there's an Enigma stroke database that we work with that we're also working on data. So we're, we're making do. We'd like to go back. I'd like to be back in my office and out of my living room. Um, yeah, I know. It, looks it like might be summer. No, <laughs> yeah, no, it's tough. I mean, I think it's tougher. I mean, I I work from home, so it's never been an issue. And I, I'm going to be 32 in um, a few weeks, so I'm in my own apartment and so forth. Nice. But um, yeah, I mean, it's. I mean, I moved back home. I, my, I grew up in the city, so um, my parents, but my mom specifically, is a few blocks away. So I moved back home during the pandemic. So it's like I'm not going to sit in my apartment alone with yeah. my dog and like just you know, um, for yeah. the majority of it. But yeah, I mean, everyone gets on each other's nerves, not in a bad way. We're not supposed to be living with one another. No, it's just a lot. It's been a long time, hasn't it? Right. Yeah. So I hopefully we're turning the corner. I um, hope so. I mean, yeah. I know in the US, but you know, in Canada, I know the borders are still shut down. Our executive oh. director is from Canada and her she her daughter yeah. is doing and the baptism's been held off because her parents can't come. I don't know if her parents are coming. Right. So yeah, it's, it's been a long time, year. But um Absolutely. Glad we can all have a roof over our heads and be able to do our work remotely the best we can. So that is true, and we're lucky to have the technology to enable this as well. So yeah, that has been. Uh, otherwise, I don't know what we'd have done. Yeah. yeah. So we're still working away, you know, head down and uh, you know, wearing our slippers with our dress clothes and yeah, yeah. exactly. And I, I'm <laughs> wearing jeans and I have a top on, so you know, I get it totally. Um, yeah. So, well, thank you so much. This was You're lovely. You're very welcome.